Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Just come right on in. We get ready to get started. Let me get in some of our other folks, all the disciples from Messiah and others who are on the line. We're going to get them in a moment for Bible study. Just come on in, everybody. We we'll give you a minute. We we'll pray that you all are doing well. All right, praise the Lord. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Let me pull up our rest of our family here and get them on. We pray that uh, you all Welcome are, and thank you for choosing free are remaining safe. As I say, careful and prayerful. Okay, we're gonna bring them on. Well, thank you for choosing free conference call. I want you all to get your Bibles ready. You can turn right to the book of Exodus. And we'll get started in a moment once we bring them on. There are 11 participants in the conference. Please announce yourself. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Great. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have our Facebook family on. We have, oh, excuse my hand, and we have also our church family on. Those who call on our line, they're on. I pray that you all can see me well. I hope I positioned that good enough. Good. Good. Okay, I think we've got it. Good to see each of you. I can't see everybody's name now. Why is that? Let's see. All right, well, listen, we're going to go ahead and get started here in a moment. Will you all get your Bibles ready? We're going to get right to Exodus. Uh, so turn to chapter, actually turn to Exodus chapter 25, and then we'll get right to 26. But let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, for your love towards us and allowing us to be able to gather for your word. We, we need your word. We can't make it without your word. And we desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Lord God, we're praying for the disciples and Messiah as they study with us together. And also all of those who are joining us, our friends near and far that are joining us on Facebook Live as well. Thank you for each of them. And Lord, I present myself to you as well praying that you will help me to expound on and share that which you placed upon my heart for our study for today. And Lord, as we sit in your classroom, we pray that you'll teach us as you always do. We rely upon you, Holy Spirit. Oh God, we are here. We're available to hear what it is you're saying. Make your word clear and help us not just to be hearers, but doers of your word as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we ask that you all would turn your uh, cell phones down if you could. That'll be helpful. Place them on, vibr on, on silent mode. And for those of you who are sitting on or use, utilizing your landlines, if you could actually make sure that you're in an area that is quiet, that'll make it easier for all of us to learn and for you to be able to grasp what's being shared. Thank you all again for joining us for our Bible study. We have been studying all year. We've been looking at um, the our relationship with God. Uh, that's, that's our focus. And so uh, today, uh, we, we, we're going to continue the new study that we started last week. Um, we, we concluded, when we concluded our examination of the manifestation of what God told Samuel, the young prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, you remember Samuel was the, he eventually became the young prophet, priest, and judge as he sat and grew under the tutelage of Eli, the, the high priest. Well, anyway, it was clear that the Ark of the Covenant was precious based on what God was revealing to Samuel. It was very precious when he told uh, Samuel that he was bringing judgment to the nation and that Eli's household was going to be impacted as well to receive judgment. And then you may recall uh, the daughter-in-law of Eli the priest. She named her son Ichabod while she died giving birth to her son, that young man who we don't know a whole lot about. But the name Ichabod means where is the glory? 
And when the Philistines slaughtered the children of Israel in the battle recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 4, as we studied already, uh, despite all of the death, the most important part of the story was to know that the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines also because she died giving childbirth. And then also, you may recall, Eli the priest, when he heard his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed in battle and he heard about the 30,000 soldiers that were killed, okay, that probably got to him, shook him up a little bit. But it wasn't until the messengers told him, the messengers said, listen, the Ark of the Covenant was taken also. That's when he fell back and broke his neck and he died. So what is it about the ark? Um, and so it, I'm just laying the foundation again, revisiting a little bit. Last week, that's why we began a study on the importance of the ark of the covenant, the importance of the ark of the covenant. And what I want to do is, because I know some of you caught the end of it last week, I'm not going to go in detail with everything, so I'm going to just highlighted the importance of the Ark of the Covenant. We will uncover its history. We'll be talking about its purpose. And we also, at some point, will look at the path of the Ark of the Covenant because it didn't just stay in one location. And last week, there were about three to four takeaways from Exodus chapter 25. We actually began the study of Exodus chapter 25. And if you wanted to turn there, that's good. If you want to turn to Exodus 25, and I'm just going to, if you look at verse one, it says, the Lord said to Moses, and I think that's important to start off because God spoke to Moses and gave him information. Here it is again, when we were studying how God speaks and he speaks in various ways. He's spoken primarily through his word. That's what we lay out. That's our foundation. That's the bottom line. But, but I, this is just confirmation for us to help us to realize that God communicates with us and he communicated with his servant Moses and he laid out in detail several things. And so in Exodus 25, we looked at verses eight and nine and the takeaway from that was that God always has a plan and God often uses us to complete the plan. Those are two takeaways. God always has a plan, and God often uses us to complete the plan. Number two, we also walked away with another takeaway from verses 10 through 22. The ark illustrates Jesus Christ. The wood represents the humanity of Christ, and the gold represents the deity of Christ. And that was how we, we, we took that from the actual creation of the ark, how it was designed based on on what God gave as far as instructions to Moses. And then lastly, we also walked away with this. God is the original designer. God designed the Ark of the Covenant to dwell in and to communicate with God's servant. God is the original designer. God designed the Ark of the Covenant to dwell in and to communicate with God's servant. I want to pull something out for you, and this was not originally part of the plan for last week's study, but I just want to lay it out for you in case you're looking at your Bible. If you look at chapter 25, verses 10 through 22, uh, what, what, what I'm going to call this is this, God is a planner. God is a planner. If you're taking notes, write this down. God is a planner. Under that, chapter 25, verses 10 through 22, we learned that God designed the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so we got that. Then if you look at verses 20 through through 30, we're not going to go through that in detail, but I just want to lay it out for you so that you can have it in your mind and also in your study. God then gives instruction about the table. So it's the Ark of the Covenant, then the, the table, and then in verses 31 through 40, there is the lampstand. So we have the Ark of the Covenant, we have the table, and we have a lampstand. Those are three items. But then if you look at chapter 26, verses 1 to 37, and we're going to be looking at that today, God is a planner and he designed the tabernacle. 
So you have the items that were to go in the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant is one thing, the table, the lampstand, but God also, again, designed the tabernacle. I hope, I hope you're catching this. Now look at chapter 26. Let's go there. Chapter 26 of Exodus. Now, I gave you an assignment to look at specific verses 31 through 33, right? Um, let's just look at that. Uh, and it says, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. For the inside of the tabernacle, make a special curtain of finely woven linen, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. Hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to four posts of acacia wood. Overlay the posts with gold and set them in four silver bases. Hang the inner curtain from clasp and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. I hope you all caught that verse. Verse 33 says, hang the inner curtain from clasp and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the most holy place from will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Now, today I may not pull out as many specific takeaways because I want to just uh, highlight some items as we go. But I hope you catch this, that there is a holy place and there is a most holy place. A holy place and a most holy place. Now, with technology today, I would encourage each of you, if you access the internet and Google uh, the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle, maybe the Tabernacle might be even better. It'll give you a good picture of what it looked like. And it's within there, there was furniture that was designed by God and it was given to Moses. Remember Moses, I described him as being like the project manager and God being the architect. And God put on Moses' heart the fact that he needed to utilize persons around him who had the ability to help uh, build each of the items that God gave him. So we call them tradesmen, if you will, uh, just to make it relevant for us, right? So now if you're looking at Exodus 26, verses 31 through 33, I hope you realize that it says inside of the tabernacle, I already mentioned that God had plans. He planned everything and he planned for, in chapter 26, these are the plans for the tabernacle. Now, I want to say something specific right here. Then we're going to go back to the beginning of, the, of chapter 26, just to walk through it a little bit. But within verses 31 to 33, I hope it is very clear to you that the ark is positioned in the most holy place, which was separated from the holy place by a thick veil, V-E-I-L. It was separated by a thick veil and this is the holy veil and it's the holy veil that was referenced in matthew chapter 27 just taking notes if you're taking notes and you want to look at this afterwards matthew chapter 27 verses 50 to 51 and you know what you make me y'all make me want to pull this out and just read this for you because this is all part of our study but we might as well go into it matthew 27 verses 50 to 51 I'll give you a moment to turn there, Matthew 27, 50 to 51. And I want you to hear this. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, listen to verse 51, because I know we talk about this a lot, especially during the crucifixion or during uh, Passover and especially during Easter or Good Friday. We talk about this. It says, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. I'll read it again in verse 51 of Matthew 27. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now, why is that so important? Now, what we're looking at and studying in Exodus is really the reference to when you have been hearing, we've been hearing all about 
the veil that's torn from top to bottom and you're trying to figure out, well, why is that so important when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, if you will? Well, where's that reference? It's referenced right here. It's referring to this study of the tabernacle in Exodus. This is when the veil is torn in two. And this, this particular veil, this reference in Exodus 26, we just read verses 30, verse 33, when God told Moses, make sure that you hang the inner curtain from class and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate, again, the holy place from the most holy place. So in other words, now you don't have to go through that veil because it's torn and you can go directly to the Ark of the Covenant. I hope you all are listening to this. You can go directly to the Ark of the Covenant. What this means, brothers, is when Jesus Christ gave his life and his blood was shed on Calvary's cross, that gave you and I direct access to the throne of God. We can go directly. So we're the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, we started off, I hope you're staying with me. We started off talking and teaching for a while about the, the, the Ark of the Covenant being taken by the Philistines in 1 Samuel. And, the, and Phinehas's wife or Eli's daughter-in-law, when she died, she named, she named her son Ichabod, the glory is departed in other words. And so when the glory left, which was the Ark of the Covenant, it represents God's presence. And if you can understand that, when you think about the fact that when God designed it originally, where it was positioned with all of these veils around it, the thick curtains, if you will, it was designed to separate from the holy place and then you go into the, the most holy place, which is only where the priests went once a year. That's, that's where the priests would go, right? So now in the New Testament, when you hear and we learn about the ark, I mean about the veil being torn in two, what that says, every one of you, every one of us, we have direct access to the throne of God. You don't have to go through anyone to get a prayer through. There's nothing wrong with going to somebody and telling them to join you in prayer or, or someone praying for you, interceding on your behalf. But you really don't have to go through anyone because Jesus Christ already paid the price for us and that gave us direct access. You know, I can finish my study right now because that seemed like that's the lesson, really. That's the heart of the lesson to understand that. But anyway, I know that we want to study a little bit more. So if you look at chapter 26 of Exodus, okay, let's walk through that just a little bit. Notice how, I, I want you to see how detailed this is. Now, we can't study all this today. We're going to be studying this for a while. This will carry us through. and We're going to come back next week again. But I want you to look at chapter 26. And here is God laying out the plans to Moses. I want you to notice how detailed it is, the color, the material, the length, all of that. Listen very closely. This is the tabernacle, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was to dwell in. Make the tabernacle from 10 curtains of finely woven linen. Notice he put the number in there, 10, right? Decorate the curtains with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. These 10 curtains must all be exactly the same size. Notice how detailed this is. He's giving Moses, he's very specific. God is saying they need to be the same size and that is 42 feet long and six feet wide. Join five of these curtains together to make one long curtain. Then join the other five into a second long curtain. Lord help us, because y'all know just like me, you all are like me, I know it. I would have messed up on the first part of the instruction. Did you say two? Oh, he's very detailed. Join the other five into a second long curtain. Then in verse four, put loops of blue yarn along the edge of the last curtain in each set. Verse five, 
The 50 loops along the edge of one curtain are to match the 50 loops along the edge of the other curtain. Then make 50 gold clasps and fasten the long curtains together with the clasps. In this way, the tabernacle will be made of one continuous piece. I, I don't know how you all feel, but I will tell you, this is these are some detailed plans or specs. Moses had to capture this. And while God is feeding this to Moses, then Moses is to convey this to those who God led him to, to actually build this, to build the tabernacle. Verse, verse seven, make 11 curtains of goat hair cloth to serve as a tent covering for the tabernacle. These 11 curtains must all be exactly the same size, 45 feet long and six feet wide. Join five of these curtains together to make one long curtain and join the other six into a second long curtain. Allow three feet of material from the second set of curtains to hang over the front of the sacred tent. Make 50 loops for one edge of each large curtain. Then make 50 bronze clasps. Notice now shifting to bronze, right? 50 bronze clasps and fasten the loops of the long curtains with the clasps. In this way, the tent covering will be made of one continuous piece. The remaining three feet of this tent covering will be left to hang over the back of the tabernacle. Verse 13, allow 18 inches of remaining material to hang down over each side so the tabernacle is completely covered. Complete the tent covering with protective layer of tanned ram skins and a layer of fine goat skin leather. For the framework of the tabernacle, construct frames of acacia wood. Each frame must be 15 feet high and 27 inches wide with two pegs under each frame. Make all frames identical. Are you all paying attention to this? Are you listening to see how, how detailed, I mean, material, the type of material, the length, the size, how many, all of these numbers. Make, now, where am I? Verse, verse 18, make 20 of these frames to support the curtains on the bases. Two bases under each frame with the pegs fit, fitting securely into the bases. For the north side of the tabernacle, make another 20 frames with their 40 silver bases. Two bases under each frame, make six frames for the rear. The west side of the tabernacle, along with two additional frames to reinforce the rear corners of the tabernacle. These corner frames will be matched at the bottom and firmly attached at the top with a single ring forming a single corner unit. Make both of these corner units the same way. So there will be eight frames at the rear of the tabernacle set in 16 silver bases, two bases under each frame. I lost God when we first started off with the numbers and don't y'all laugh at me because I know y'all did too. If you were Moses trying to figure this out and take all of this in, can you imagine? And I'm not even through, God's not through. Look at verse 30 though, it says, set up this tabernacle according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. You were shown. God revealed this. He communicated this to Moses on the mountain. Verse 31. I read it already, but now so that you hear the whole picture, you get the whole picture. For the inside of the tabernacle, make a special curtain of finely woven linen, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and with skillfully embroidered cherubim, hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to four posts of acacia wood, overlay the posts with gold and set them in four silver bases, hang the inner curtain from clasps and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Lord Jesus, I'm tired already. Uh, that's a lot of information that God downloaded to Moses 
And this is all designed for several things. And I hope you, I, I'm really gonna pull out, I'm gonna give you three words. And, and, and what we have been looking at falls under these three words, if you think about what we just read. Number one, think about the word strength. Strength. Number two, think about beauty. And then number three, think about the word appreciation. Strength, beauty, and appreciation. Now you say, well, where's the strength? The strength of, of, of God's sanctuary is revealed to us in the actual construction of it. That's where the strength of it lies. And then the beauty is revealed in its adornment. The adornment as you just think about it now now even if you never saw a picture of what this looks like just based on what we read and you read the various materials the color the size the rings the different types of materials that are being used according to god's plan in his mind notice there is strength in it and there is beauty in it now, where is the strength? The tabernacle was a solid structure which the beautiful curtains were draped. And if you didn't capture it, I'll just say there were 20 boards of acacia wood, 15 feet high and 27 inches wide, overlaid with gold from, they were formed, uh, let me make sure I got it right now, overlaid with gold formed the north and south walls and eight similar boards formed the west wall. And each of these boards stood on two silver bases made from the shekels collected from Jewish men of military age. Since the structure stood on the uneven ground, these bases were necessary for stability and security. God's sanctuary, because this is, and that's what this is, this is God's sanctuary, is where God would dwell. That's why we're looking and we're primarily focusing on the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of the Covenant was inside, located inside the tabernacle, which is the sanctuary, right? I hope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with something in a minute, and I hope you all caught this. You have the tabernacle. Inside the tabernacle, you have the Ark of the Covenant as one main item. There are other items, as I mentioned, you have a table, lampstand, and other things that we'll mention. But the main piece is the Ark of the Covenant because it represents the very presence of God surrounded by the tabernacle. I said that there's strength in it because it's built with stability, of course. And I mentioned the beauty, such as the gold, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, all of these, and white, they're major colors used in the hanging covering of the tabernacle. And I'm just going to leave it there with you because, we, because we've actually walked through quite a bit of detail today. And like I told you, I wasn't going to give you a whole lot of takeaways because I wanted just to take all of this in. It's a whole lot. But originally, I started off this lesson saying that God is a planner. And he designed the Ark of the Covenant designed the table, the lampstand, and here in chapter 26, designed the tabernacle, which is to house, if you will, several pieces of furniture. But the main one that we should be thinking about is the Ark of the Covenant. It represented, again, the very presence of God. Now, now for those of you who didn't put this together, I'm going to do like a fast forward of something that uh, we often have heard about. But think about this. God is such a beautiful designer. He design. He think about his mind, the mind of God. Now you say, well, how could God come up with all this? Well, he designed the world. He designed the earth. He put stars in space. The moon, think about it, the sun, the water, the fish, 
All of that was designed and created by God in the mind of God before it manifested itself. God revealed the tabernacle to Moses as well as the Ark of the Covenant, all of the other items, right? I'm going to end with this. The tabernacle, think about this. The tabernacle was surrounding the Ark or the presence. It was like a type of of body. I hope you're going with me. So our bodies are like the tabernacle because within us dwells, bless his name, dwells the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are the temple or like we said in the Old Testament, the tabernacle of the presence of God. God lives in you. God lives in me. God lives in us. If we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, the very presence of God by his spirit, he dwells within our, our bodies are like tents. Just like this tent, the tabernacle is like a tent in the Old Testament. Our bodies are like that. So, you know, when you when you when you would go to funerals and you hear uh, sometimes the preacher of the past will say for our earthly tabernacle will be dissolved and all yes at one point the tabernacle you have no need for the casing the outer this 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 casing is gone it is flesh it lasts for a certain period of time but the ark of the covenant or the very presence of god will last forever god is spirit come on and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh my, I'm ready to go to sleep now. I could take a nap because this is so much. We've eaten so much food, believe it or not, within chapter 26. And I want to encourage you to reread it again. Take it in. And then I believe I gave out an assignment last week. We looked at, let me give you the assignment because some of you need to finish that. Go to chapter 40, verses 1 through 21. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 21. I want you to reread that if you if you read it already. If you didn't read it, read it now with Exodus chapter 26 as a backdrop. And then next week when we come back, we're going to pick up a little bit more looking at the strength, the beauty, and why we should say the appreciation for the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and how, in particular today, how the tabernacle was designed. Because think about it, God had you in mind. God had us in mind. And think about the details that went into the tabernacle. And if you can't imagine that, okay, look in the mirror. Think about the body. Your body, my body, the heart pumping, the blood that goes, the, 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 the arteries, the veins. Uh, think about how the brain, just think about the brain by itself, how complex it is. Uh, think about hearing, speech memory, nerves, sending signals to different parts of our body. We can have knees, we have our feet, we have our arms, we get all of that, muscles, bone. God put us together and fashioned us so beautifully. But this, when he created us, that was nothing in comparison even to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is so detailed. And yes, we see how awesome it is. But think about you and me. If you can't understand the tabernacle, think about the fact that God was so awesome that he had us in mind before he even created us. He thought of us beforehand. So he thought, then created. And he does the same thing with the tabernacle. It was in God's mind and he communicates it to Moses. Moses executes it exactly the way God designed it. Oh God, God is an original designer, brothers and sisters. He is an original, and I thank God for each of you, and I pray that you have been strengthened and encouraged because God, despite what we see going on today, if I had to make it relevant for today, despite the pandemic, despite the racism, despite all of the, the, the corruption that we see from Washington on down, despite the fact that we don't know when there will be a cure, how there will be a cure of right now for this pandemic, despite the fact that we have seen 
some of our own people, our own black and brown brothers and sisters killed by some corrupt policemen, despite the fact that we even now, if you notice, we see a, this rising of killing amongst ourselves. After all of that, guess what? God is still the designer. God is still the creator. God is still on the throne and he has a plan and he will execute it to perfection. God is not sleep. God, this, this does not catch God by surprise. It caught me by surprise. It caught you by surprise, but it did not catch God by surprise. And I have a sneaky suspicion that God is still up to something. I have a sneaky suspicion that God has something that he's about to do, even in the midst of all of this confusion that we see and that we're experiencing. And, and it's evident that when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, and what we're studying, God had so much in mind. And we're looking at it, we're studying it. So when the veil was torn from top to bottom in the New Testament, when Jesus died, this was already in the mind of God beforehand. It was a type, the foreshadowing, looking at that veil of the temple, the veil around the tabernacle, the veil of the tabernacle, giving direct access to the Ark of the Covenant or the very presence of God. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you got something out of this study today, this lesson. We're going to conclude right here. We went over time a little bit, but remember that God loves you. He cares for you and me, and he is still, again, God is still on the throne. He will execute everything the way he wants to. So thank you for joining us today. Next week, study Exodus 40, verses 1 through 21. You can also review Exodus 26 again, just to pick up some of the pieces. Look at what we shared. We gave quite a bit of meat today, and we pray that you'll continue to run on, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we have to do, brothers and sisters. We have to bathe our minds, bathe our spirit in the word of God. For some of you, you never, maybe this is the first time you actually even looking at this uh, in the Bible. Some people heard about it. Some people didn't, some people never heard about this. We, we, some people get to Exodus and they look at the fact that God used Moses to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. And once they get past the Red Sea, they forgot about everything else. But there's a lot in scripture. There's a lot in Exodus that we need to study looking at the importance of the Ark of the Covenant. Brothers and sisters, thank God for you. Let us close with prayer. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. For your word is still a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And it is my prayer that you will bring healing, bring deliverance, bring salvation, bring understanding and clarity and affirmation of your power, of your awesome, mighty works. The fact that you can think, think, in your mind, you can think and design things before they manifest themselves. Oh God, you're an awesome God. And so Lord, help us to better appreciate your beauty, better appreciate your strength, better appreciate your power. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, even for everyone that joined us for study on our conference call line and those that joined us on our Facebook Live uh, platform, we pray that you will deal with each of us. Help us to think of these things, to think of your power, because you're still, you still have the whole world in your hands. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Amen, God bless each of you. And remember, as we always say at Messiah, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. This has been Pastor Logan and we love you. <laughs>